Good morning, everyone, and welcome to MGFA's Wellness Series webinar, Stress, Anxiety, Worry, and Coping During Challenging Times. My name is Jenna Umbalo, and I'm the Director of Patient Advocacy and Community Engagement at MGFA, and I will be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Please remain on mute throughout the presentation and submit your questions via the Zoom chat located on the Zoom menu bar, and we'll answer them during the Q&A segment. Today's session will be recorded and available online. I'd like to give special thanks for the support of our Wellness Series presenting sponsors, Alexion, Argenix, Momenta, and UCB, and our supporting sponsor, Immunovan. We've got a great presentation ahead, and now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Christina Christman. Dr. Christman is a fellowship-trained board-certified neurologist and neuromuscular specialist. She currently serves as a section head of neuromuscular medicine and director of the EMG unit at Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix. Dr. Christman has presented at numerous national conferences and has very pu various publications, which include co-authoring textbook chapters on ALS. Dr. Christman's outpatient practice focuses on patients with neuromuscular disorders of all varieties, and she enjoys treating patients with myasthenia gravis in particular. Dr. Christman, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you guys for joining me this early, especially on the West Coast and the Southwest uh, where I am. I'm going to share the screen here and start my PowerPoint for you guys. Hopefully this works. There we go. Um, so the topic today is coping with stress, anxiety, and worry for myasthenia gravis patients during COVID-19. But this topic I think could really be for anyone. And I think I learned a lot when researching this topic as well. So some of these scenes might look familiar to you guys. National emergency empty store shelves, everyone wearing mask, COVID numbers going up, especially out here in Arizona, we were really a hot spot for a while. Um, people out congregating, seeming to not wearing masks as the headline of uh, coronavirus numbers soaring. So I don't know what to say, except it's coronavirus and we're all in misery. So all of these um, events going on and the news and everything has been particularly stressful. Um, so pandemic is stressful for a lot of reasons. So part of it is, um, you know, the, the virus itself. Um, and, you know, this is something that we don't know a lot about. This virus is still new. Um, and so understandably, there's a fear of the unknown. And then especially with patients that have myasthenia gravis, of course, um, being immunocompromised at high risk for, for Ill, illness, worry about contracting the virus or spreading it to others. And um, this has caused everyone to um, be concerned about their job and financial situation due to what the virus has done with the economy um may cause worry and concern for others frustration around change i know a lot of things in my daily life have really changed and it's quite frustrating not to be able to get back to normal and inability to partake in activities that normally bring us joy um, like going out shopping going to parks restaurants and um, because of the need to stay away from others to spread the virus this can cause a lot of isolation and loneliness, which can be stressful as well. 
So I wanted to just start by, and I'm not an infectious disease expert at all, um, but just talking about, um, you know, what can we do um, to at least help with that um, fear of the unknown, you know, so we understand um, what do we know about this virus and what to do in situations where we are worried. So um, ultimately, um, make sure you're following the guidance of your doctor and resources um, that are reliable. So what we do know is to prevent the spread. Um, we want to limit interactions with those inside, outside of our household. Um, avoid shaking hands or physical contact. That's something I've had to change in my practice. Normally, every time I go see a patient in the clinic, I'm shaking their hands. So we have to consciously think about that. Uh, maintain six feet of distance between people wear masks when you can't, um, washing hands frequently, using hand sanitizer, cleaning and disinfecting surfaces, stay home if you're sick. Um, think about having a, at least a 30-day supply of your medications. And I think um, this is important as well. Um, and a lot of people have um, put off some of their regular care um, for chronic medical conditions due to fear of contracting the virus by going into the doctor's office or to the hospital. But um, you know, look at how long this has gone on already. So it's very important not to delay care for necessary treatment. And then if you are concerned that you might have symptoms uh, or exposure of COVID-19, please contact your doctor. And um, as of about a month ago on the CDC, symptoms of COVID-19 include fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, loss of taste or smell that is new, sore throat, runny nose, vomiting, nausea, or diarrhea. And then, um, so contact your doctor, of course, if you're concerned about any of those symptoms, um, except in the situation where it is emergency, you need to seek immediate care. And that would be, um, you know, extreme difficulty breathing, um, pain and pressure in the chest, starting to get confused, um, difficulty staying awake, bluish lips or face. Um, so that's, um, you know, what we can control is understanding the virus and knowing what to do in this situation. If we are worried about um, ourselves or others um, having an exposure or having symptoms, but um, what can we do for our wellness um, and coping with the stress of the virus and the pandemic? That's what I'm going to focus on most today. So again, I learned a lot um, when researching this and um, there's a lot of techniques and um, tips that I'll point out um, that I learned about as well. Um, well, first of all, some people um, we've seen during the stress of the pandemic have resorted to various ways of coping uh, with stress that's um, a distraction and it may be different for different people um, excessive food intake. Some people have turned to drugs or alcohol or overuse of medications which are prescribed to them. And these are a way of distracting ourselves from unpleasant emotions and trying to escape from that. Um, that's not the healthiest way to deal with this as, we, as we've seen. And um, what we really should do is try to recognize these negative emotions um, which is totally normal um, and find healthy ways to cope with the intensity of those negative emotions. So uh, one thing that we came across is music. Um, and I tried to look at this in an evidence-based way and provide you guys with some um, techniques uh, of wellness that have been studied. So in 2019, uh, Dr. Graf at University of Pennsylvania, um, she's an anesthesiologist. Um, she did a study assigning patients who um, were having a surgery um, and you know, they needed some kind of anxiolytic anti-anxiety medication prior to the surgery. Um, so normally they would use benzodiazepine, um, and, but instead she took a, a group to compare to the benzodiazepine patients and assigned them music as medicine. 
and it was serene music of some kind. Um, classical music, I think they were looking at mostly. And it proved nearly as effective in easing patients' anxiety prior to the surgery. So music absolutely can be um, a great technique um, when you are feeling those negative emotions, um, whatever you find is relaxing to you um, and uplifting. Um, there is a technique to cool off um, if you are feeling very stressed and very intense emotions. Um, if you are in a situation where your emotions, your stress are escalating to the point of almost like panic attack, this may actually be a very good uh, technique to bring it down very quickly. Um, so it may sound strange, but the technique is taking a large bowl of ice water, um, take a deep breath, and then dip your face in the water and hold it there for 15 to 30 seconds. And um, the thought is that it activates the body's dive response and it slows your heart rate. Um, and this was looked at um, at University of Washington uh, psychology professor, Dr. Lyman. Um, breathing is very important in um, regulating your emotions and dealing with stress. Um, so there's different techniques on pacing your breathing. You can try the basic technique, inhale for five seconds, exhale for five seconds. You can try inhale, hold it for five seconds, and then exhale for five seconds. You can use a timer. Um, or there are various guided recordings, um, which I'll show you guys later, of um, apps that um, have meditation and guided breathing. And this has been shown to help lower blood pressure and promote a sense of tranquility. Um, meditation uh, does take some working up to. Um, it can be um, a little bit intense for some people um, when you really uh, dive into it. Um, meditation has been looked at um, in an evidence-based way. Uh, there was a study in 2019 uh, in Australia where um, patients meditated for 45 minutes a week. Um, the participants uh, in the meditation group as compared to a control group experienced increased recognition of their stress triggers, increased ability to detach from these stressors, increased calmness, and increased ability to prioritize work. Um, so meditation uh, can be daunting at first, but it can be really beneficial. Um, just even starting with five to 10 minutes at a time. And if it is too difficult to just um, try on your own, um, there are a lot of apps, which I've listed here, um, that you can download that will walk you through it. Headspace is one that's really popular. And our company um, where I work at, um, Banner Health, um, has provided that um, for free to us. adult coloring books. Um, so we've seen these kind of popularized um, in recent years, um, but um, this, this has been um, looked at. Um, any kind of um, making art actually may help with anxiety. So in a 2016 study, um, researchers looked at um, subjective and objective measures of anxiety. Um, looking at college students who are preparing for their final exam. And um, they had the participants um, participate in art making um, projects for 30 minutes. Um, and there was a statistically significant reduction in anxiety in the participants compared to the controls. So um, most likely this um, art making um, can be um, extended to other meditative activities. Uh, so we think that's what it is. Um, it's the um, meditation and the focusing 
on something other than your anxious thoughts that's helpful. So um, the coloring book um, idea is great, but other meditative activities that you like um, may work as well. So take 30 minutes and focus on something like gardening or crafts, cooking, yoga, whatever it is for you. So speaking of yoga, that's um, what I personally enjoy as um, my relaxing technique. Um, and it can be um, all different levels um, of physical activity. It's really adaptable to people with um, you know, different um, physical abilities. So it can be very gentle or um, more strenuous and challenging and invigorating. So yoga involves um, poses um, combined with controlled breathing exercises. And there is evidence that yoga can modulate your stress response systems, um, including reducing the heart rate, lowering blood pressure, and um, making breathing easier. There was also a study that showed yoga can improve pain tolerance in patients. In gratitude journaling. So um, this was looked at in 2016 in um, participants who were seeking counseling services at a university. And this study looked at three different groups group that received psychotherapy only, psychotherapy plus expressive writing. So expressive writing means these um, participants were writing their deepest thoughts and feelings about stressful experiences and focusing on that. And a third group, um, which um, involves psychotherapy plus gratitude writing. So they, um, instead of focusing on the stressful experiences, wrote letters expressing gratitude to others. And the gratitude group actually reported significantly better mental health than either of the um, other groups at the end of the 12 week trial. So this may be something um, very helpful as well um, during this time of stress um, is um, trying out journaling and in particular things that you're grateful for. Physical activity definitely is a stress relief really for a lot of people. Um, the benefits have been looked at a lot and um, there is evidence that aerobic exercise training can have um, antidepressant anxiolytic effects and that protects us against the harmful consequences of stress. Um, you know, stress causes your heart rate to increase, your blood pressure to increase, and that can be harmful um, physically in the long run. Um, so whatever it is for you, um, whatever physical activity you're able to participate in, you know, you don't have to be a marathon runner to benefit from this. So whether it be um, just walking or using a stationary bike, um, pool is really great. Um, for people um, that do find um, physical activity difficult um, because they, uh, you know, gravity can help support you. Um, and I know we don't have access to uh, gyms and things like that. So even jogging in place, jumping jacks, arm circles, have to be creative with our physical activity these days. And it's important to stay socially connected, um, even if we can't physically. So I tend to use the term um, physically distant instead of socially distant um, because we want to stay socially connected. That's really important for our mental health. It's important for dealing with stress, um, relying on others, staying connected with others. There are numerous studies that show maintaining satisfying relationships with family, friends, and the community um, lead people to be happier, have fewer health problems, and live longer. Um, so maintain your connections um, virtually, um, whether it be by phone or mail, um, through social media, um, and 
try to stay involved with community organizations um, that help you, you know, participate in a social community. On the other hand, unplugging um, is also important. So we know um, the phones, computers, and technology, um, it's really getting us through um, a lot right now, but it may have a dark side. Um, so there was a study in 2015 um, where participants were required to turn off phone notifications during the day. Um, and these participants actually felt less stressed and more productive um, than the individuals who were constantly getting their phone notification and their texts and et cetera. There was a small um, subset of the patients in that trial, though, the ones who did turn off their notifications, some of them, um, it actually made them more anxious because they were worried about missing important information. So just take this with a grain of salt and um, remember whatever works for you. I do feel sometimes like um, there's, there's too much technology and taking a short break from it sometimes um, can be stress relieving as well. Um, and that's because the constant technology is a perpetual distraction. Um, and we know that um, there's a correlation between high smartphone and internet use and poor attention and memory and learning. Um, using technology too much, especially your phone at bedtime, um, can lead to sleep dysregulation. And it can disrupt your work-life balance. Um, a lot of us are staying on our devices because it's part of work. And then that makes it more difficult to disengage from work and relax. Um, and then again, there's um, fear of missing out and um, comparison. A lot of comparison that happens on social media, um, especially as people may put out versions of themselves on social media, which look good, but may not be entirely true. And all this comparison can also add to stress. So there are important reasons also um, to unplug, but maintain your social connections, have a balance. So it's also important to recognize when it is too much. So we are all experiencing stress and anxiety right now. This is normal. Um, I listed a lot of different ways um, to help deal with that, but there may be a point when it is too much and actually need professional help. So signs of um, anxiety or depression that may need treatment include changes in sleep or eating patterns, you know, to the extreme, um, like difficulty sleeping, difficulty concentrating, if this is leading your chronic health problems to get worse, um, if patients do have a mental health condition, which is getting worse, um, including lots of harm to self or others, increased sense of hopelessness or sadness, or um, turning to substances, um, these may be signs to seek help. Um, so I listed here, there. if you do feel there's any kind of mental health crisis going on for you or someone you care about, um, there's the Disaster Distress Helpline, help um, Suicide Prevention Hotline, and Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, so unfortunately, that's been an issue as well. And these are all my sources um, on the trials that I cited. And that's all I have today. Thank you so much, Dr. Chrisman. That was really great information. Um, we have a couple questions that came in, so I wanna address those with you. Um, the first one is, my mother suffers from anxiety attacks. She, had, she never had prior to her MG diagnosis. It's really more generalized anxiety especially when she has to do something she is worried about, her weakness being an issue. Is generalized anxiety a symptom or just an effect of having MG? Uh, 
Um, yes, I think, you know, everything in the body is connected. And certainly having myasthenia gravis, when it affects your breathing, um, it can be hard to tell sometimes, is it difficulty breathing or is it anxiety? So it could be either. Um, and we do know that um, anxiety can make myasthenia gravis symptoms worse. Um, so I think, I think it's related, but not necessarily, um, you know, having anxiety is not necessarily part of myasthenia gravis, um, but it can be exacerbated. Great, thank you. Um, this, this next question is, will MG patients be able to take the COVID vaccine once it's available? I think we don't know um, enough about the vaccine which is coming yet. Um, that is a good question. Um, for my myasthenia gravis patients, most of them I do encourage to get their flu vaccine and other annual vaccines um, annually. And that's especially because um, it would be much more dangerous for them to get those particular viruses rather than um, the vaccine. So we'll have to see what safety um, you know, um, recommendations uh, come out with the vaccine, but especially as COVID is a respiratory illness, you know, a lot of my senior gravis patients cannot afford to get it. So I think most likely it will be one that my senior gravis patients are recommended to have, but we'll have to see the details. Okay, and that kind of leads into the next question, which you kind of answered there is, um, should MG patients get the flu shot this fall? I definitely encourage my patients to uh, get the flu shot, um, but discuss with your doctor, you know, it may depend on what um, medications you're on and things like that as well. Okay. Um, and somebody asked, <clears throat> what about a pneumonia vaccine? Yes, yeah, same, same with that vaccine. Um, I usually recommend that. Um, but again, discuss with your doctor um, because, you know, some patients are on some very unusual immunosuppressants and that may change things. Okay, thank you. Um, how can stress affect my MG? Yeah, so st stress can make any chronic medical condition worse. Um, you know, um, physical health and mental health are, are definitely connected. Um, and, uh, you know, especially as I was mentioning with the, um, with the breathing, um, a lot of people as um, a symptom of stress, their breathing increases. And so it can be hard to determine sometimes, okay. is it the myasthenia gravis or, um, or anxiety? Um, but it definitely can, can lead to exacerbation if you, you know, don't get it under control. Yeah. Um, with COVID, as, as an MG patient, I'm extra cautious. What's the best way to handle stress of others near you not taking the same level of precaution? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, if people are not taking precautions, ask them nicely to please maintain their distance, to please put on a mask. Um, that's all we can do and then removing ourselves from situations where we don't feel safe you know um, avoiding dining in the restaurants if you can get carry out get grocery delivery if you can if you're not feeling safe in these environments yeah i think i've been seeing a lot of information recently about the, the idea behind resiliency and, and trying to make sure that you're mentally equipped to deal with some of these stressful situations that can be beyond your control sometimes. Um, situations just like this where patients or people in general are trying to be as cautious and follow the protective measures, but it, it can be um, it can be difficult to deal with people that are trying, that are are practicing different standards than you. But a big approach to the resiliency is making sure that you don't let their negative behavior affect your mood so negatively, meaning that 
somebody you ask them and they don't respond or or maybe they do you don't hold on to those feelings and harbor that negativity for the rest of your day or your week saying i tried to go out i tried to do this but there were too many people in my way so i feel now i feel even more frustrated and i don't want to leave the house ever and i'm not going to try anymore um have you seen similar instances or situations like that hmm um yeah i mean it can be very frustrating um because things are are out of our control so we just do our part and do our best to educate others um because when you know when we wear our mask it's it's not really for ourselves it's for others um so all we can do is you know try to set the example and try to educate um others yeah um, this next question is, how much extra exercise should I do so that I get the health benefits, but I don't make my MG symptoms worse? Yes, that's a very good point. So you really have to listen to your body um, and do what's appropriate for you. Um, so if your mycenogramus is, is not under great control, um, then you might notice that um, you start um, experiencing weakness with excess physical activity, that's you know that's when you want to stop. That's what we don't want to happen. Um, but there have been some uh, trials looking specifically at rehab and including respiratory rehab. And we know that um, doing these things is not harmful to your mycenia gravis in the long run. Um, if you experience any signs of your um, weakness, then just rest and just just be mindful of how much is enough for you. But if you are under good control with your myasthenia gravis, um, physical activity shouldn't be a problem. You're not going to make anything worse. Thank you. Um, this next question is, can you speak to small children about the risk of transmission? I have avoided contact with my young grandchildren, yet emotionally, emotionally this is very challenging. Any suggestions? Yeah, this is very tough. Um, I I understand. I um, actually am going to visit my family uh, soon, and I have um, 83 year old grandmother who's on oxygen, and it's you know very sad that I feel like I can't go and give her a hug um, this time I see her. Um, so it's tough. Um, I think we don't know exactly everything about the risk of transmission. Um, we do know that children seem to be less affected, but they are probably a big part of the carrier um, component of this um, virus. So, um, you know, even if the children are not sick, they could easily carry it. Um, so I think it is important to, to keep um, precautions if these are not, um, you know, people that you see every day, um, they're not in your household, you know, the guidance is to wear a mask. So when I go visit my grandma, I'm gonna wear a mask the whole time that I see her. Um, and it's tough, but I, I feel like it's what I have to do to protect her. That's great. Um, th this is a good segue to the next question, which is, Wearing a mask seems to make it harder for me to breathe. Is that the case? Yeah, so I totally understand that. Um, I um, work in the hospital and I wear an N95 all day long and it's very, very annoying. Um, however, it really should not impair your ability to exchange oxygen um, wearing the mask. Um, there's been a lot of data about that. And we know doctors and surgeons who spend the entire day in the OR, you know, for decades, um, they can still breathe. Their oxygen seems to be fine. Um, probably what that is, is the, this feeling of claustrophobia, with something covering your face and you need a break from it um, to feel like you can breathe. So um, that's totally normal. Um, it shouldn't really impair your ability to exchange oxygen, but it could um, 
lead to a feeling of claustrophobia. And for some people that does um, cause them to start hyperventilating and um, breathe faster, which, which can be very difficult for it to breathe. So I understand why some people have difficulty wearing masks, um, but we do the best we can. Thank you. Are the mental health effects of stress more pronounced in MG patients? And is it more impacted by means of what they have control or control of or no control of? Um, yeah, so I see a lot of um, uh, patients with a lot of neuromuscular conditions. And I do see that um, it seems that people that are coping with this the hardest are um, patients with chronic illness that either impairs their respiratory ability or requires them to take immunosuppressant therapy so they know they're at risk. Um, so I've seen this in you know patients that have autoimmune myopathy that are on immunosuppressant, um, you know, ALS patients where their breathing is affected, et cetera. Um, so of course it makes sense that with myasthenia gravis, just due to the nature of the condition, um, this is probably more stressful um, because you're worrying about a lot more, you know, what, what could happen to me? Um, could this cause an exacerbation? I'm going to be in the hospital, um, et cetera. And I, th I think it is about, um, you know, not having control of everything and fear of the unknown, unfortunately. So hopefully there's um, something in the talk today that um, drew your attention that, oh yeah, I can try that um, technique of relaxation when I'm worried about these things. Thank you. Um, this next question is, is there less of a risk to have a, a home infusion for MG medications versus doing it at an infusion center? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I think, you know, you should take into account um, whatever is best for you and discuss with your doctor. You know, some patients, depends on what type of infusion they're getting, that it really is better for them to be monitored in like an infusion center setting with, um, you know, uh, facilities and, and nursing staff around. Um, however, yeah, when you go into a facility and you're interacting with more people, um, you, you do worry a little bit more about the risk of transmission. Um, and having maybe just one person come into your home, um, you know, that's less ex people exposure, but it still depends on that individual and how careful they are as well. Um, but yeah, most of my patients right now, um, especially are getting infusions at home. Thank you. Um, something that is stressing me is the fact that we might have a plasma shortage with less donations due to COVID. What can we do about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think let's, um, there's probably not much that we can do about that. Um, other than encouraging people who can to go out and to donate. Um, you know, I have not heard anything about a shortage coming up. Although, you know, what you mentioned that makes sense that if they're using plasma more for other things, um, is that, you know, potentially down the line? Um, but, you know, um, usually the, um, the plasma um, for um, medications, it's, you know, far, far in advance that they have their supply. So, you know, companies, I'm sure they see what's going on right now and they can start ramping up appropriately. So if we see any shortage, it's probably not going to be for quite some time. So um, the MGFA is actually participating in an advocacy campaign to, to ask for more plasma donations because something that we did learn is that because of COVID, there's been, um, a, there was a time when most of these um, facilities were closed or they were not receiving as many donations as usual because of the restrictions around uh, social distancing, physical distancing. So um, like you said, there is not an imminent shortage at the moment, but this is a this is a public health campaign that um, the Surgeon General has put out some information about as well. And if anybody needs more information about that, it is available on the MGFA webpage. Um, so this next question is, 
are there um, no inborn causes in the brain chemistry to trigger anxiety or stress? Um, I think, so yes and no. Um, everyone experiences anxiety and stress, and that doesn't mean there's an abnormality um, with the brain chemistry in any way. Um, everybody's stressed right now. This is normal. Um, it just may be the extreme to which um, we experience it and how we deal with it. Um, but yeah, we do know that people that have um, a predisposition for anxiety and depression, probably people that have been dealing with this for most of their life, um, it is sort of like a chemical imbalance. And that's why we have um, medication that help to regulate um, and to increase your sword, um, serotonin and your dopamine. Um, some people that um, that is just inherent um, runs in their family. And there should be no shame in seeking medical attention if that's something that you've been dealing with um, because there is treatment for that. Okay. Um, this, is, this is a question from, um, from the chat. It says, how will you know if you are in remission for MG? I have MG for almost, I've had MG for almost four years and five months, and I'm currently experiencing anxiety and depression the past few days. It's hard to deal with it, especially this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so specifically the question about remission uh, for myasthenia gravis, it definitely can happen. Um, there's a true remission means um, no disease symptom of myasthenia gravis and able to come off all uh, immunosuppressive therapy. Um, what we see probably more often is minimal disease activity. So patients who are well controlled taking medication, um, but their disease is so minimal that it's not really impacting their life. Um, you know, that, sh that should be a goal for a lot of patients. This is a very treatable condition. Um, but I have seen patients that do go into remission. It's usually after a period of years um, and they're working with their doctor able to wean off everything. Um, and um, the um, anxiety part of things, um, you know, like, like I said, that's, it's affecting everyone and it can, uh, you know, exacerbate myasthenia gravis when you're feeling stressed. It can make any kind of uh, chronic medical condition worse. Um, so we have to work on coping with it the best we can. Great. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's it for our questions today. I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Christman for this wonderful information. Thank you especially for sharing your resources and your knowledge with us. I want to thank everyone who participated in today's webinar. Thank you for joining us and thank you for all of your questions. The MGFA will be hosting this series throughout the end of September, so please be on the lookout for additional invites. And thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.